Alrighty. Looks like we got a few more people on Zoom today. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks to those of you who are sick for keeping the rest of us safe. We very much appreciate it. Um, so today we're going to continue with our lecture on research. Um, we'll see if we get to an activity today or not. Uh, and then if not, we'll do it. Right. This class, as you can tell, even though I have like a sort of regimented schedule, it's flexible. We're going to go with what fits where. So. Alrighty, I am going to just uh, call the roll real quick and then we'll get started. Mia and Deja and Nora. Monica, Sarah Ellis, Miriam, Lauren, Akaya, Lyric, Onyx, Wright, Ray, Kevin, no, Alex, Sarah Foster, Antoinette, Jenna, Linda, and Lisa. Okay. All right. So we were talking about uh, research studies and in particular experiments. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and put this in our slideshow and I'm going to backtrack just a little so we can go over this research study in a lot more detail. Um, I also have a few things that I realized I didn't put on the slides I'm going to cover so I'll make sure I like go slowly after we finish the lecture and write stuff up for y'all all that good stuff so. Again, we were talking about experiments and we're going to be manipulating some independent variable and seeing how that affects the dependent variable. So again, we're going back to our hypothesis. People who binge eat be more likely to do so in response to negative moods than in response to neutral moods. All right, so this is how we would do that stuff. So we would... Um, have people come in to whatever our laboratory setting is here at BWU. We have a couple different spaces we can use. We actually do have a dedicated research lab over next to Dr. Martirell's office. Um, we also have one of the rooms, interview observation room with a one-way mirror. So we can use that. Um, a lot of times when our students do studies and they don't need specialized equipment, uh, they've just used like one of the study rooms at the library because everybody knows where the library is, right? So, you know, let's say we were doing this here, we'd have them come into our research lab, okay? And so everyone who came in using that random number generator would be randomly assigned to either the experimental group or the control group. When we've recruited people, we know binge eat. And so how we do this is sometimes we'll do like a, a pre-screening online as we recruit for the study. Sometimes you just advertise that way, like do you binge Come be part of our study. Um, sometimes we get referrals from like a clinic or something like that. At large universities, so where I went to grad school, we would have, I wanna say like three or four sections of interest like every semester that were um, 500 people each. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like overwhelming. <laughs> this is much nicer, obviously. And so what we would do is have folks um, do what's called mass testing. So we would just have a whole bunch of people take a bunch of questionnaires for a bunch of just different labs at once. And embedded in that, we would have a question about binge eating. And then we contact the people who endorse binge eating and say, hey, would you like to participate in this other study? And usually there are incentives, whether it's like our class where you get credit for class. Um, sometimes for more intensive studies, there may even be monetary value where they get on the ticket. So for my dissertation study, people actually received money based on how diligent they were in filling out the diary I had them do. 
So everybody got at least five bucks, but you got up to 15 if you were really good at it. And this was back in like 2009. So I pay people a lot more now, honestly. Um, and so they're randomly assigned to these groups. They come into the lab, we have them sit down. We assess their mood right there, right then. And there are lots of different questionnaires we can use to do this. Um, my favorite is called the PANIS. It's cleared up. And so that is the positive affect and negative affect scale. Affect in psychology is just a fancy word for saying mood. So this one, it's like 60 questions, but they're all like one word. And you say how much you're feeling that word, like sad. Um, so people can get it filled out in a couple minutes usually. So it's a nice baseline. So probably have them fill out something like the panics. Oh, positive affect, negative affect scale. And so affect is that. <laughs> So they come in, they do that. Then we are gonna have them do the IV. We're gonna have them do the experimental manipulation. So in this case, if you remember, we're gonna try to induce depressed mood in our experimental group, but induce a neutral mood in our control group. Then we're gonna reassess mood, give them that tannis again, and see essentially did their mood change? We're kind of doing what we call manipulation check. <laughs> did it actually change their mood, right? And then on the table in our lab room, we're going to have some sort of food available. Now, depending on the study, there's a couple different ways you can do this. One is that you can use generic food, like everybody gets the same food. So some studies I know, have just set out like bowls of candy and been like, oh, well, while you're working on stuff, you could munch if you want. For this study, because we're actively recruiting bingers, uh, we would probably have foods that typically make people want to eat a lot of it, even if you're not a binge eater, things like donuts, right? Uh, chips. And sometimes in studies like this, what they'll do is actually ask the person coming in, what are your foods that tend to trigger a, break, a binge? And we would have those specific foods available for them. And so how can we manipulate the press food? As I mentioned before, we might show a clip, play some music. One of the other ways you can do it is using what are called the Velton mood cards. And these are just like index cards people look through and they have statements. Um, in modern day and age, these would probably be uh, put on a computer screen instead. Uh, but today is neither better nor worse than any other day. However, I feel a little low today. Sometimes I wonder, wonder whether school is all that worthwhile and so on and so on. And the idea is these are supposed to encourage people to feel a little yuckier than usual. Again, we don't want people to feel awful, awful. We don't want people to be overwhelmed. But what we do want is to essentially induce people feeling a little more black than usual. Now the control group, there are also built in neutral statements. And these are just facts and factoids, things like, Oklahoma City is the largest city in the world with area. Um, we have two kinds of nouns denoting physical things, individual and mass nouns. Saturn is sometimes in conjunction beyond the sun from Earth and not visible. Um, so again, stuff that really isn't gonna elicit positive or negative emotion, they're just sort of facts. Okay, cool. So again, that's what they would get during this experimental manipulation phase. That is our manipulation of the independent variable for this particular study. And so 
after we reassess mood just to make sure it actually changed their mood. And we see, are the people who are feeling more depressed more likely to consume more calories, essentially? And what we typically find with a study like this is, yeah, they are. Um, and this doesn't have to be someone who binge eats, just people in general. We tend to use food as comfort. But um, I think about 30 years of research now shows that negative mood is one of the most significant contributors to uh, particularly binge eating and purging. There are also ways that we can take the um, experimental method and extend it. So we don't always have to be, I don't want to say stuck, but like limited to, there's a nice way to put it, being in the lab. Yeah. Since benzene is an intravenous order, where does that's a good question, yeah. So uh, we're getting to ethics, which is really important to think about when we're thinking about um, research in general, but particularly when we're gonna research things that are potentially psychological disorders. Yeah, we would have to have the people give informed consent where they would say, yes, I know that you're gonna see how much I'm gonna eat, you know, especially if we're doing the one where we're getting in their binge foods, you know, they're gonna be well aware of that. Um, and then we're going to make sure that we offer them resources, right? So referrals to therapy if they feel like it's really problematic um, and things along those lines. But yeah, this is something we always have to be aware of as psychologists is, are we going to do more harm than good by doing these studies? We don't want to, obviously, but it has happened in the past. When we get to social sites, we're going to talk about some really messed up studies people did. Um, if anyone has ever heard of the Stanford prison experiment, really screwed up scenario. Uh, so there have been times in the past where psychologists have not done a good job of this. Yeah. So this is something we have to be aware of, be careful of, and make sure, again, at the end of the study, we would then reinduce positive mood. We give them a full debriefing where we explain what we did and why. We give them referral information for therapy and other sources. And this gets trickier, honestly, as we move to larger scale studies, right? If I'm doing a study where folks like y'all are gonna be my participants, it's really easy to just put the referral information for the counseling center on there, right? But what if I'm doing a study where in theory, anyone in the country could do it? So I use a system sometimes called Amazon's Mechanical Turk, M Turk. Uh, and people sign up and they can do often tasks for businesses, like rating things for businesses, sort of market research for small amounts of money. And those sort of add up over time. And a lot of social scientists have started using them for research because we're relatively low cost. We still try to pay them ethically, right? But you can get a lot of data really quickly. And so when I do those type of studies, it's like, okay, what information do I provide, right? So I might include like the National Suicide Hotline, links to the American Psychological Association's lists of, of members who are therapists. Um, I did a study a few summers ago um, about uh, LGBTQ plus individuals. I didn't include trans individuals just because I feel like their relationship with their body is so unique, they need to be their own study. Uh, but about how, you know, body image affected them. And I included resources like the Trevor Project, which is um, an online and phone call accessible hotline for folks who are feeling overwhelmed who are LGBTQ+. So yeah, this becomes a big part of what our responsibilities are as people who conduct research is what do we do? How do we do it? And how do we keep the participants safe? essentially. Because as psychologists, we want to benefit society, right? We want, we don't want to be harming people. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. All right, and some of the ways we can make sure we're being ethical is by doing things like quasi-experiments instead of experiments. So quasi-experiments is where you want to compare two groups, but you can't randomly assign people to them. 
So can anyone think of an example of groups we want to compare where we can't randomly assign folks? What's that? Yes. Uh, what might be an example of two groups we want to compare where someone we couldn't come in and draw a number out of a hat and say, you're assigned to this group? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, like if we did our study with binge eaters and we wanted to compare them to non binge eaters, we couldn't like randomly assign and be like, now you're a binge eater, right? Uh, nor would we want to do anything psychologically to make them binge eaters. Yeah. And exactly. Something like PTSD, we don't want to cause someone to experience a trauma. Um, if we're studying people who experience specific traumas like child abuse growing up, we're not going to randomly assign you to be abused, right? Um, other simple things are gender. We know we can't randomly assign gender. We can't randomly assign race. We can't randomly assign socioeconomic status, age, things like that, right? Um, and so we might then have the two groups and study them. And sometimes what we'll end up doing is what we call like a two by two study, where we might have, let's say we wanted to look at binge eaters and non binge eaters. Draw this up here. So we've got our bingers and our non bingers. But let's say we still want to do the same study we just did. Well, what we can do is then also assign them to either the depressed or neutral cards. <laughs> it is basically, right? Uh, and so then you would have people in each square and we have analyses we can do to compare whether, you know, being exposed to the depressive words made non-bingers eat more than non-bingers who were close to the neutral world, but then also see if the binge eaters who were exposed to the depressed words ate more than the non-bingers who were also exposed to the depressed words. So we can get really complicated. <laughs> and in fact, uh, because a lot of these sort of like, I don't wanna say simple, this isn't simple, right? But sort of clear cut studies have been done already. More and more our experiments are getting even more complicated. So I'm in the midst of coding for what we call a meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is where we take existing published studies and each study becomes essentially a participant in a big study. So you take and you code data from the existing study and that becomes one line in your data set, just like an actual person who was a binge eater would be one line in our data set. And so what we found is that, so, I should back up and explain what I'm studying. So I'm looking at the relationship between social comparison. So comparing your appearance to those around you, it's a natural tendency, we all do it, right? And body dissatisfaction. And the way that we often induce this in studies is we show people pictures of like purposely attractive people, right? So people who meet the thin ideal, people who are facially beautiful, things along those lines. Well, those studies have kind of all been done. And so now you have much more complicated things like um, one of the sets of studies I really find interesting is they take photoshopped images of models and they'll put a disclaimer on it or not. And like what happens if you tell someone this is photoshopped? Is that helpful or is it not helpful? Intuitively, a lot of psychologists initially said, well, that should be helpful because it draws attention to the fact that this is unrealistic. My favorite study related to this, they use technology called eye tracking, which I think I'm gonna mention before, allows you to see where people look on the screen and in what order and for how long. And what they found is people would read the statement and look immediately at the part of the body where if it was like, this person's abdomen has been photoshopped, they'd look at that part of the body immediately, <laughs> like stare at it and scrutinize it. So, you know, stuff gets really complicated now, but this is sort of the basic idea within psychology is that, okay, there's some stuff we can't randomly assign. That doesn't mean we can't ethically study it. We just 
do these quasi experiments and try to have what we call matched controls, right? So if we're looking at survivors of child abuse, for example, we're not going to have a bunch of 12 year olds and compare them to adults who haven't been abused, right? We're going to find 12 year olds who haven't been abused, things along those lines. Trying to match generally on race, age, uh, gender, things like that. So again, this allows us to be more ethical as we approach these things. Natural experiments also allow for that. So natural experiments occur when nature itself or a larger man-made phenomenon manipulates the independent variable. So the picture here is from September 11, 2001, right? Uh, we would never want to randomly assign a city to get a terrorist attack, right? But what we can do in the wake of that is study how to help people and apply that moving forward. So there were a whole host of studies after terrorist attacks. There have also been studies after hurricanes, things along those lines. Um, so after September 11th, there was a lot of interest, a lot of clinical concern uh, to examine the effects experiencing these attacks had on those who had loved ones who were victims or who directly witnessed the attacks like this young woman. So they examined things like predictors of developing PTSD. Really interestingly, one of the studies that I thought that was they looked geographically and it's probably not surprising, but it's just like, I think the first time someone had actually looked at it in this way, it was like the closer you were to Manhattan in terms of where you lived, the more likely you were to get PTSD. But even nationwide, there was an uptick in PTSD because so many of us watched it over and over on the news. Like y'all were probably too young to watch it, but like, I remember I was sitting, I'm, you know, it's the beginning of the school year, so you get the crud, we called it, basically whatever cold always went around and knocked you out. So I'm sitting in the health center and like the new, watching it on the news and they just kept showing the tower just falling over and over and over. It's just, yeah, it was horrifying, right? Um, and it didn't feel real. Right, it felt like watching an action movie until you processed it. Um, this is kind of a boring question, but it has to be kind of Are you sure that the news ethically should not have played a role or anything that would have an effect on how people feel? I mean, yes, but I'm also not a journalist, so I need to fully acknowledge that. Although I was an amateur journalist in high school and college, I worked for our papers. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that the news needs to take into consideration. I think the clearest example of this is in the deaths by police aggression in particular of people of color. Replaying those over and over and over is unnecessary and extra traumatic to individuals of color. Uh, and there are studies showing that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, if psychologists could help with the news, I think we would. There are ways you can show things, talk about things without showing the actual traumatic event itself. I also think that other media probably has an obligation to look into that. Like I hadn't watched Avengers Age of Ultron in years, but then after I watched WandaVision, I was like, I should rewatch that because I don't really remember what happened in that one. And there's an instance in that movie where the Hulk runs into a building and it falls just like the tower of September 11th. And like for me, 20 plus years later, it's still like, triggered a lot of anxiety and stress. Uh, so I don't know that we need to replicate that for entertainment, right? And yet people do that all the time if you think about, and I'm guilty of it. I love true crime documentaries, oh. right? <laughs> like my favorite are about cults. So one of our assignments we're gonna do later in the semester is like how not to join a cult. Um, and because it's all social science, it's all social psychology basically. Um, but yeah, you know, that like we often exploit these things and where are the ethics in that, right? We need to be aware of that. Yeah, some other studies they did, which is really interesting, uh, was they looked at things like, okay, the Red Cross workers who were at ground zero, they actually found a higher rate of alcoholism among them in the wake of it, because they were trying to cope with what they were seeing on the ground. And again, although we never want to like take advantage of those folks, the stuff we learn in the wake of September 11th, particularly like what helps people on the ground right away, helped with later disasters. So when there was the tsunami and the nuclear meltdown in Japan, um, 
I actually have a friend from grad school who was and it's not in the military, so he wasn't really deployed, but he went over there to apply some of those techniques essentially right away. So we call this like psychological first aid, basically. So again, it's hard to be like, oh, a tragedy happened. We can benefit from that. Like we never want to think of it that way. But it's sort of like, what can we learn that we can then like apply to help people in the future? Or ideally, I'm sure there were social psychologists who were studying like, how do we prevent stuff like this, right? Not only at the level of like TSA and things along those lines, but also, uh, you know, people who are terrorists, people who are uh, folks who, you know, have commit mass shootings, things along those lines. Analog experiments involve using animals to study basic behavior. Um, and so some of this is really simple. If you've ever seen uh, videos of Coco, the ape who could use sign language, she like had a kitten and everything. Um, that was a social psych experiment, right? That was an experiment about language. Sometimes these are more invasive. So there were folks at my grad school who were experimental people. Us clinical people were like, nope. Um, <laughs> but who would do studies where they had rats or mazes and they actually had electrodes implanted in their brain so they could see which part of the brain was lighting up. That starts to feel a little like, oh, right? And I totally get that. So this can be pretty controversial. Um, and certainly uh, our neighbors, PETA, for those who don't know PETA as their office in downtown Norfolk, uh, would not be all about it. I, I just told one of my other classes the story last week. Um, we got an email once to the department when I was in grad school and they were like, if you see a rat, we don't have an infestation, it got away. And we were like, go rat, go. <laughs> uh, because a, a little known thing about animal studies, bless you, is for things like rats and mice, they often euthanize them after the study is done. Uh, animals like great apes, monkeys, they'll use them for multiple studies. Um, lifespan issues and whatnot. Uh, other fun side note about animal experiments is you have to carefully time things. So part of what happens when you an animal experimenter is you kind of become a breeder too, because you can like buy the racks. They're like catalogs of racks. It's sort of weird to think about, right? <laughs> like, um, but then like, if you find a strain you like, rather than keeping spending that money, you'll breed them. And then you need to like be there when the pups are born sometimes because you're looking at developmental things. A friend of mine in grad school who was an experimental person didn't figure out the timing right, and she had to be in the lab on Christmas because her rats were pumping. So yeah, you got to kind of like in any experience, you got to kind of think about that. I did that to myself, maybe my first or second year teaching. Didn't think about, did a study with a one week follow up, ran people the day before or the week before spring break. So I'm like on vacation on spring break, sending out emails. <laughs> It's like, no, I'm never doing this to myself again, right? <laughs> Alrighty, and then single subject designs. These have a whole host of names. Sometimes they're called single case experiments. So they're basically case studies, but you're gonna try to use the experimental method with this one person. So you're gonna test a therapy usually, something that'll help them using a scientific framework, but rather than have this big group of folks come in, it's one person. So you're looking at the same individual over a period of time and their behavior at one period of time as compared to later time points. People said what, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, very cool. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so if people don't know what that is, um, the corpus callosum is the connection that runs between the two hemispheres of our brain. And some people who have severe epilepsy, in order to try to localize the seizures to one side of the brain, they'll actually cut the corpus callosum surgically. Um, this leads to a whole host of really interesting things where people <laughs> like 
Like if Camp. you draw a square with one hand and a circle with the other hand, perfectly. Exactly. And like they don't necessarily like recognize things on one side, but then if they pick it up, they can. Um, because it also has to do with like how we see, how we perceive. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting. And they'll think they can't see stuff, but they can. So yeah, someone like that, you might do a single case study to help them figure out what's gonna work for them. Oftentimes, exactly what we just said, like Abby just said, these are super rare things, right? We're not going around just chopping corpus callosum left and right. <laughs> like, no, these are very severe circumstances. Um, so this might be, you know, someone with a really rare psychological disorder or a really rare neurological disorder. Um, and so the most common design here is what's called the ABAB. And those labels just refer to the different parts of the experiment. I mean, we could have called it like time one, time two, time one, time two. Um, and so A is just the baseline. Before you do anything, you want to measure your GB. See how that person's doing before you intervene. B is when you introduce your independent variable. So then you want to see, is their behavior changing after we implement this therapeutic technique? If it is, that's great, but we're also working with one person and we know that people's lives, as we talked about with case studies, are really complex, right? So there could be other stuff going on in their life that led to that change in behavior too. So then what we do is we take away, our second A is we take away that treatment, the IV, and we see, do they return to baseline? What happens with their behavior? And then, we reintroduce that technique, that therapy, whatever we think is gonna help our independent variable. And if it works, we just keep it going, right? We just now found something that helps this person. And this makes a lot more sense when you have an example. So I'm gonna give you this example of Chris. This is something I found in a book. This is not a case I personally knew, um, but she was a 19 year old who was severely uh, developmentally delayed. So she was probably operating on like a elementary school level, right? Um, and she also had a disorder called trichotillomania, not something you need to know how to spell, but this is a fancy name for people who, when they're stressed out, will actually pull their hair out. Okay? And they don't even realize they're doing it. So they sort of like do it, like some people chew their nails or some things like that. Um, and this can get pretty severe. So in Chris's case, she actually had bald spots. Um, I had a student once with trichotillomania. She was really open about it. She did presentations about it. And she would pluck her eyebrow hairs. And so like one day she came in with like half her eyebrow gone. And I was like, what is going on? I have friends who like have like no eyelashes. They like just pull out all their eyebrows. Yeah, yeah. It, like it really depends on the person where they pull. So some people will even do like arm hair or leg hair. And sometimes person like have like their too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it, then it, uh, that's sort of like a combination with a disorder called pica, where you eat a non-food, non-nutritive substance. I love that for DSM-5, they had to add in non-food because there are so many non-nutritive substances that we create now, like Diet Coke, technically non-nutritive, right? But it's a food. <laughs> um, but yeah, so people with pica might eat their own hair or they sometimes eat things like mud. A lot of my strange addiction with like eating glass or laundry detergent is essentially just pica. But as you can imagine, it's really problematic for your digestive tract. And the same thing for people who keep the hair from trichotillomania, they can form what we call the zores and they can like stop up their system. It's kind of like a hairball in cats, but like we don't have the ability to spit it up like a cat does. So as you can imagine, it lead to blockages and things like that. With pica, you could also have them eat things that are dangerous. So I saw Grand Rounds on Pica while I was on my residency. And um, there was someone who was eating like, I don't remember if it was actually silverware or plasticware. Regardless, there are sharp edges, right? You can like tear part of your intestine for things like that too. Um, my favorite though, again, we never want to like make fun of someone, but this person was able to make fun of themselves so we can kind of go along with it. But the psychiatrist was talking about a case she was seeing where the young woman would read books and then she'd eat them. 
her favorite were the Twilight books for whatever reason. <laughs> so I don't know if they were extra delicious or what. Uh, but again, like some of these substances are potentially pretty dangerous, right? Yeah, so in Chris's case, she wasn't eating it, but she still got bold spots. I'm like, maybe it doesn't seem that problematic, but anytime we're, we're manipulating our bodies in ways they shouldn't be and we're not adequately caring for them, right? We risk the infection, things like that. If she's pulling it out and there's, you know, some sort of blood, if she pulls too hard, right? Things along those lines. Uh, it's the same reason why if you get a piercing or a tattoo, they leave you with a giant list of how to care for it, right? And sometimes they can't do an antiseptic because they want to make sure that you're taking care of it. And obviously someone who's developmentally delayed might not be able to do that. And so they decided, let's try to see what can help her. And so Chris actually has a much longer baseline than usual. And I don't have the full information about her, but just my researchers guess is that they were trying a whole bunch of other stuff to see if there was anything that would help her, right? And there were a couple times where it seemed like it was helping, but then the hair pulling came back. So this graph is the percentage of time she spent manipulating, pulling her hair out. And they would measure this by video recording her while she watched TV, because that's when she was most likely to do it. And so they were racking their brains. How can we help her? Uh, usual treatments for trichotillomania require some pretty high level thinking. Like a lot of therapies are written sort of at the college level, basically. And like trichotillomania, it's a lot about analyzing why you're doing it, recognizing when you're doing it and why, things along those lines. And something like that's just not gonna work for someone with a developmental delay like Chris. So they kind of came up with like this ingenious little way to do it, which is they took those wrist weights that look kind of like wristbands and they put them on her wrists, two and a half pounds, nothing that's gonna hurt her, but just enough for her to notice when she moved her arm. So when they put those on, her hair manipulation went down to zero because anytime she went to move her arm to manipulate her hair, she realized it and she didn't do it. That sounds awesome. Great, we fixed it. But again, if you want to really make sure, we have to remember another time where she didn't do it and it seemed like maybe it was fixed and it wasn't. And so then they took the weights off. And what you see here, it went back up to essentially where it was at baseline. Put the weights back on, boom, right? And so the hope would be she doesn't have to wear weights every time she watches TV for the rest of her life, but that eventually this makes her aware enough that she doesn't need to. But if she does, again, it's something fairly non-invasive, pretty easy to do. Exactly, yeah. And a lot of this is based on behavioral principles, the idea of like reinforcement, you know, we try not to punish, uh, but maybe not rewarding things along those lines. Definitely. All right, this is just like sort of a silly comic about some of this. I also said there's a couple things that I didn't put on the slides I do want to go over. Um, so I'm going to do that. And maybe the next time, my next semester, I'll remember to add these in. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things I want to talk about is samples. So samples are the people we do our research on. And they are a part of the population. The population would be everyone available in the group, right? So let's say I do a study, and I've done this before, where I send an email to the student listserv, and I say, hey, anybody can click this link and take this survey. Well, not everybody's gonna do that, right? There's like 1,600 students at Wesleyan. Maybe 100, 200 will click the link, right? So that ends up being my sample. Samples can be purposeful. It's like when we talked about our binge eaters, right? There we carefully selected our sample of people who had a specific trait, right? And again, sometimes that trait is not as difficult. Um, so I tried. Professors get something every seven years or so called a sabbatical, where we get a semester to just work on our research. You have to apply and have a proposal. Um, but on my sabbatical, what I tried to do was replicate some research I'd done with women with men. It was really hard. <laughs> There's a couple different reasons. One is if you look around the room, 
this is pretty similar to our usual composition in psychology classes. There's not as many guys take it. And then just in general, not as many guys participate in studies. And there are ideas from socials like about how like women are more trained to be helpers and things like that, right? But like even just sampling from the men was more challenging than sampling from the women. So interesting things to think about. Sometimes you'll also choose random samples. This happens a little less often now, but for example, back in the day, even before my time, they would actually like take the phone book and like have every seventh person in the phone book they would contact. And again, not all those people are going to answer, but you're trying to get some randomness. Um, a random sample means that each member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. And we do still use these for some things, not just necessarily research. So for example, um, each year they give a teaching award uh, to a professor and it's actually decided upon by a committee of students, which I think is really cool. Um, and those students are randomly selected. <laughs> I remember uh, I have a colleague who's since moved to a different school, uh, but her husband had actually decided to go back and get a degree in environmental science, something he was really interested in. And uh, so he was a student here while she was a professor here, and they asked him to be on the committee. <laughs> but he was, to, he was like, I can't because my wife is nominated. And they were like, what? Oh. He was like, different nonsense. Um, so yeah, you know, sometimes you end up with interesting things when you do random things. Um, research setting. Um, I mentioned that you can do research in a lab. And our labs in psych are typically not what you think of when you think of like doing a lab course here. Although certainly, yeah, go ahead. So what would the difference be between the sample and the population? Good question. So the sample is who's actually in your study, the people who actually come and take part in your study. The population would be all the people who in theory could be part of your study. So again, if I send out an email to everyone at the WU, the population would be all 1,600 students. My sample would be the people who actually clicked on my life. Very good question. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, and that research can take an application in a whole bunch of different settings. So a lot of our labs in psychology aren't going to look like chem or bio labs. Um, so they might just be a place with like chairs for people to come in. Or a lot of times there are computer monitors, computer um, consoles, because they're going to have people do specific research in those settings. Um, however, there are some psychology labs that are essentially bio labs. There's a neuropsychology, biopsychology side of psychology where people might actually be studying the brain or people that do experiments, those comparative experiments with animals, right? They are gonna keep a clean setting. But a lot of times it's just gonna be a space where someone can come in and you can work together on whatever the study is. There are a lot of advantages to this, right? You get to control the setting. You get to like set it up the way that works for you. Um, our lab space, I've had students come up with really creative things. So I had a student, I don't know how many years ago now, but a while ago, um, who wanted to do a study about how women felt trying on different pairs of jeans. And so she turned part of it into like a dressing room and had them like rate their mood as they tried on the different pairs, very cool, right? Um, but a lot of times it's just sort of tables and chairs, you're controlling the setting, you're making it distraction free. But there can be some drawbacks. As soon as you walk in a lab, you know you're being studied, right? So you might act a little differently than you would naturally. Uh, it can feel really unnatural. Again, we often go out of our way not to make it feel super unnatural, right? Um, and the people who actually volunteer to do the studies, the people who end up being our samples, go to the lab, probably not totally representative of the population, particularly if we're doing a study in person. It's really hard to get people to come in in person. It takes more time out of your day than an online study, right? And so it's often like the most dedicated students or depending on the time of semester, the students who really need that course or extra credit. <laughs> so that could kind of go either way. Um, and some aspects of the mind and behavior can be difficult to examine in the lab. 
sometimes what we do to kind of counteract that is study people in a naturalistic setting. So a lot of times these are observational studies. Um, sometimes we would just have people, uh, you know, we would sit and people watch basically. And you're not reporting anything specific about specific people. So it's considered not an invasion of privacy, but it's just sort of like a general reaction. Um, my favorite use of this is uh, we had a student a few years ago for their capstone study. Um, they took two people and they had the, the people who were acting as the research assistants like fully aware of what they're doing. And one of them was more conventionally attractive than the other. And then they had people, those two people just go around and ask people in the cast um, or in the grill, will you participate in a study? And then the whole thing was, will more people agree to sign up if the person's more attractive? And then that's what they found, you know, not surprisingly, but it's just kind of a really cool study where like they didn't have to get people to sign informed consent, things like that, uh, but they got a lot of really cool information. We also have ways to do this now in a way that's more controlled. And so sometimes you'll see these called diary studies or ecological momentary assessment, which is abbreviated EMA. Uh, so in this case, you're gonna, we used to give them paper diaries. Some people still might do this, but now typically it's like an app on your phone. Um, I did an EMA study for my dissertation. It was just when like the iPhone was starting to come out. So not a lot of people had them. We gave people Palm Pilots to carry around. Really technologically advanced. Um, <laughs> but what happens is people will get a a uh, reminder throughout the day, a notification that tells them to fill out the diary. And in the moment, they respond to questions. Sometimes these will also include like, if you do a certain behavior or if a certain event happens. So like one of my friends was really interested in how people felt right after they exercise. So she had, you know, the random ones throughout the day, but then she also had, after you exercise, sit down and do these questions real quick. These are meant to take two minutes to fill out, they're not very onerous, but you get a lot more cool information about like what's happening to that person in the day. And then you can kind of look at how things change with different events that they experience. Uh, I'm gonna skip the statistics stuff, uh, but I am gonna talk just a little bit more about ethics in the couple minutes we have left here. Um, so we, I've been talking about ethics and there are lots of things we can do as psychologists to try to do experiments more ethically. One is one that I've already mentioned, which is informed consent. So with naturalistic studies, you don't need to do this, but any other type of study, pretty much you do. So this is a paper you read over that says, this is what you're gonna do. Here's the risk, here's the benefits. And you have to sign it often online it's like click a box that says yeah i agree to this but it tells you what's going to happen so you're not going in blind so then we also have at the end of the study the debriefing and this is what i mentioned where we like tell people what you were doing and why and give them information about resources that might be helpful if this didn't bring up anything for them. Oftentimes this is a paper we hand out to people for in person or it's like the last page of the survey if we are doing a survey online. And uh, the biggest thing that you want to maintain while you're doing research as a psychologist is confidentiality. So your obligation as a researcher is to make sure that people's data doesn't get out, right? So you are not going to go be like, oh, so-and-so just came and did my study and guess what they said, right? Um, a lot of times now, particularly if we're doing studies online, we go one step further and we make it totally anonymous. 
You never have to put in your name or any information like that. Uh, and people seem to feel more comfortable opening up and answering questions, honestly, that way. Alrighty, so we will do an activity about research on Friday, and then we'll start diving on into motivation. Yes, you.